Welcome everyone and good evening um, and happy Thursday. Um, my name is Teresa Wilkins. I am the director of the Lipa Ratner Museum of Art and I am so excited um, and thrilled to be here virtually with all of you this evening um, to celebrate our St. Petersburg College um, Fine Arts faculty. And we are here tonight specifically with our fantastic artist, Kim Karchman. Kim is going to be taking part in our virtual artist talk, which is part of our series of educational programs surrounding our exhibition of the faculty show for the um, St. Pete College Fine Arts faculty. Um, it, joining us tonight in the galleries at the museum is none other than our curator, Christine Rank Carter. Hi, Christine. Hi. Hi. Um, I just want to remind everyone to please keep your microphones muted during the presentation. Um, if you have any questions or any comments you'd like to add, please make sure to type those into the chat. Um, I will be making sure that I'm moderating the chat uh, so that we can address any questions or um, anything that uh, might come up for anyone. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Christine for a quick introduction um, and maybe to take a little peek at those works behind you. Hey guys, hey everybody. It's nice to see some, some friendly faces out there. Um, I am indeed in the middle of the uh, exhibition, the St. Petersburg College Visual Arts Faculty Show. Uh, we always look forward to having this show around every two years or so here at the Leeper Ratner Museum of Art. And it's always personally my greatest pleasure to work with our talented faculty. Uh, I wanna personally thank them all, especially this year as we've all had to face these challenges. And uh, we always of course wanna honor these um, faculty, not only as educators, but as uh, extremely talented fine artists. And we really applaud what they've had to do, especially this year in pivoting quickly to learn how to teach art online. Uh, tonight, I'm really excited to introduce Kim Kirchman. Kim has been an associate professor here at SPC since 1993. Uh, she's based on the Clearwater campus, and she's the lead instructor for ceramics, sculpture, and 3D design, and has recently also taken on 2D design. Uh, behind me, if you can see them, are three beautiful works by Kim. Um, they're hand-built platters with uh, her unique uh, slip transfer design that she does, which she will talk a little bit more about. Uh, I encourage you to come by to not only look at the works here that are actually featured prominently in the front window of the exhibition, um, which I am looking out over a sea of um, the Fine Arts Administration, administration Building right now um, in the front window. But her colleagues and Kim, they're also featured in an exhibition at the museum called Elemental from the Collection, which features fine crafts. So please come see Kim, Jonathan Barnes, and Mackenzie Smith while you're here. A little bit about Kim. Uh, she earned her BFA and her MFA from the University of South Florida. Uh, she started out as a painter and she evolved into a, sculpture, a sculptor and uh, discovered clay as her preferred medium of choice. Her interest in functional forms developed from the structure of domestic life, such as sharing meals with, that make deep connections with family and friends. Kim focuses on the slab construction and functional wear with a slip transferred imagery. As a fourth generation native Floridian, the lush natural landscape influences form and imagery that is depicted on her work. Here, we will get a glimpse of Kim's home studio, which she shares with her husband, Mark, also uh, an artist. And at Hidden Lake Pottery is located in Odessa, Florida in the countryside. And she's also uh, learning to teach from her um, studio there as she's working on SPC's online art classes. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kim Kirchman. Thank you all. Um, it's really nice that everybody's here. Um, thanks Teresa and Christine for putting together this great show and putting together this program. So today what I'm gonna be doing is sharing a little video that I put together with my iPhone, uh, walking around my studio, um, 
I'm not a filmmaker. <laughs> so I'm just gonna put, throw that out there as a sort of a caveat. Um, it's a little bit of an introduction on my kiln and a little introduction to my studio. And then I built a, 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 pla a, a basket and over about three hours and put it on a time, a, I took time lapse video. So the whole video is only about five minutes and then I'm gonna um, go into my um, PowerPoint. So let's see if I can get this up. So let's share and audio, hopefully. Hi everyone, I'm standing outside of my studio. This is a picture of my kiln. Um, it's a huge kiln, it holds about 500 pots. Um, I fire this with my husband, Mark Fell, and also the, with friends um, and my good colleagues, um, Mackenzie Smith and Jonathan Barnes have so helped. Jonathan Barnes helped to design this kiln and Mackenzie and Jonathan actually helped us build this kiln. This kiln will hold about 500 pots when it's fully loaded and takes about 14 hours of fire. We actually stoke it with wood the entire time and um, it's fairly labor intensive, but in some kind of weird ways, fun. This is a shot inside the kiln itself, and you can see that the walls actually get glazed with the soot that's thrown in at the top of the firing. It might be interesting for some people to see the interior of my uh, working space. This is my work table, and as you can see, I've got a number of uh, glazes and colorants that go on to the pots themselves, and I've got these really great windows which allow me to see outside um, towards the swamp that we live in. Uh, the nature that's around me has a huge influence on the imagery of my work. Hi, for this next part of the uh, little video I'm putting together, I wanted to do a time-lapse um, video of a demonstration of how I build things. Now, um, when I start this process, I hand build all of my vessels. They're sculptural in nature because I started as a sculptor and I wanted that to be a big part of the impetus of making my uh, functional work. I moved to function um, after having children, quite honestly, because I wasn't gonna do sculptural installations anymore. So what I've done is I've started with um, a piece of newsprint and I've actually uh, created an image on here that I'm gonna transfer onto a slab of clay. Once that's transferred, I will proceed with building the piece. So hopefully you'll enjoy this. Um, it is a rather long process, hence the sort of speeded up nature of it. Um, in the video. Um. Charlie, have a 
So that's just a little um, screenshot of how I build and sort of the sculptural objects I do. So I'm gonna go on to the PowerPoint and um, sort of talk about my work more formally. So I can get this up. That was great. Oh, uh, was it? <laughs> that was fun. Okay. Well, of course, now I've, I've, I've of course, screwed up a little bit here, which is uh, what happens in Zoom. <laughs> we go to the front. You're seeing the whole thing backwards. Damn it. What a mess. How did this happen? Okay. Oh, okay. Woo, I'm here. <laughs> Sorry about that. At any rate, um, you know, the video is a little bit weird, but it was kind of fun to put that together. And I think it's important for people to sort of see how things are built, um, but not in real time because it would have been super boring. So this talk really starts with the kiln. And um, in some ways, people think the kiln is the end point of firing, but um, I pretty much feel like it's the beginning point in a lot of ways because you have to make decisions about the surface. So this is a picture of my husband, Mark, in the front, and um, I'm just going to go through this uh, relatively quickly. So this is my backyard. Uh, this is where I live. Um, this is Hidden Lake, hence the name of the pottery. Um, I, I feel like environment is really important. And um, this came about because of a number of, of events that happened in my life and how it sort of changed Mark and I's idea about um, both workspace and living space and how important it is to become a, when you're an artist to have a good environment. So I just sort of love this. So I started with really old pieces. And this is actually a piece I made about 35 years ago. It's not a great piece. Uh, but what I would say about this is this is the first piece that I felt like I created a sort of a sense of my own voice. And um, because I was born and raised in Florida and because I'm so influenced by the natural environment, um, this was the first piece that I made um, that sort of feels like that um, kind of space. And um, it's oddly enough wood fired, <laughs> which is where I've sort of come back to. So I started making a number of forms and because I started as a painter, I was very interested in color and surface. And you can see that there are certain motifs in the work and certain approaches to making work that um, are still within the pieces that I make now. So I'll just go through these a little bit. These are all vessels. Everything you make in ceramics is hollow and it's a vessel form. And I think vessels are really interesting because it's not just about the skin of the piece itself, but it's also about the interior area of the piece. And I've always talked to my students about this. The, the space inside is actually more, almost more important than anything else because it affects the form. It can either stretch the form out or the form can contract around the space. Um, and so I try to have sort of a sense of that in all of these. This is a fairly large form. It's I don't know, maybe three and a half feet tall, maybe three feet across. It's all slab construction. You can see these are pretty elaborate. And when you don't have children running around, you can make pretty elaborate hand built things. Um, this is just another shot in my studio. So all of the pieces started as greenware and I created a bunch of sketches. You can kind of see a sketch in the back of that one. And then um, the finished pieces on the right hand side. Uh, this is probably four and a half feet tall and was all suspended from the ceiling. And for whatever reason, I became really interested in suspending these objects um, from the ceiling um, to sort of defy gravity. Um, obviously, they have a botanical um, sort of reference point. Um, some more. And so I was making a number of these vessel forms. I spent years actually sort of working on these, um, creating these kind of interesting um, references back to the things around me. Um, as uh, Christine said, I'm a fourth generation Floridian. I grew up in, um, in fact, my father was born in um, Belle Glade, Florida, which is uh, south of Lake Okeechobee. So I feel uh, really tied to the Everglades and to 10,000 islands. Um, I, my life was spent growing up down there. 
And um, I moved into um, more sculptural sort of large scale um, forms that were a combination of both ceramics and other materials. Um, I became less uh, connected to materials um, specifically like clay and um, interested in other kinds of things is this latex and wire and sometimes human hair. <laughs> Uh, this is a quite of a large piece. It was, um, it's taller than me actually. It was a uh, latex um, cast against a sculpted object with all these um, sort of clay pieces spilling out. And uh, what's interesting to me still about these pieces is kind of my commitment to this uh, sort of repetitive um, kind of activity of making. Uh, when I was making these in my studio, they were so labor intensive uh, my friends had to come and to my studio to talk to me and um, the conversations that we had, I felt like they were woven into the fabric of the pieces themselves. They, it was like a conduit for um, that kind of activity. And I think this idea of conversations and connections to um, people through work is um, intimately connected to vessel making and sort of functional form. So um, after uh, a while making these big objects and then having children, I was sort of mucking around. I was making um, some pots and, and I will say this as a caveat, pottery, functional pottery making is a problem that remains difficult um, to me in many ways. How do you make a piece function really well? Um, how does it have aesthetic um, sort of considerations? And sometimes you have to sort of either go one way or the other. So in about 2009, um, my father died in 2008. And I think a lot of people, um, he was my last parent. And when both of your parents are gone, um, you have a sort of a psychological shift and you start thinking about what's important. And right at that time, I took a number of students to Japan for a study abroad trip. And um, the, the experience of Japan was incredibly important. And um, it was important in a number of different ways. It was important in terms of the sense of aesthetics, um, even functional objects like these brooms um, that was just, these were in the courtyard of one of the inns we stayed in um, are beautiful objects in and of themselves. And the consideration of functional form as the aesthetic form and how it informs your life, like um, in terms of how you react to the world and how you live or that space just became just a huge um, motivational force. So this is an image of uh, the Inari um, temple in Kyoto. So we were in Kyoto uh, for a big um, celebration and we took the students into Inari and this is a pretty well-known temple. The um, gates go all the way up the side of the mountain and the thing that really struck me with this was um, the fact that in Japan, um, space becomes really important in the way you move through spaces. And in this particular space, you were moving through areas of light um, and then um, the gates went through areas of really dark woods. And so it was always this constant um, sort of unveiling of different kinds of spaces and experiences. Um, which are related to um, ideas about um, the space in between things or that sort of liminal space. You're not in one space or another, but you're sort of in between. Um, and and I'll, when I get to my vessels, I'll sort of talk about that a little bit more. Um, of course, I was enamored by the gardens in Kyoto. This is a lotus and one of the lotus ponds and then um, on um, the right and then on the left are some dianthus and a bamboo garden, it's so beautiful, these gardens. And also um, the sense of history and sort of uh, these aesthetics. So Japan is no, known mostly, I think, in people's minds with this really kind of simple, uh, organic, uh, pared down sort of aesthetic. But um, in Kyoto, they have a celebration, it's called the Matsuri Gion, and um, it ha it's been 1200 years. It's, a, it's, a, it's the longest celebration in Japan. Um, and so some of these floats, while they're not 1200 years old, the tapestries that are hanging from them are, and some of these tapestries came from Europe uh, via the Silk Road, which is really interesting to me because um, 
as the West was influenced by Eastern aesthetics, um, also Asian aesthetics were um, influenced by the West. So these are just images. Um, and because artists look at imagery and imagery always finds themselves on their work, this idea of, these, of the grid, um, of layers of pattern, of color, the juxtaposition of the organic against the, um, the inorganic or the geometric just um, is just something that's um, really important. So this is uh, looking up at one of the large um, floats. And the other thing about Japan that was incredibly important um, in the West, especially in the United States, pottery is considered a craft um, and it's considered a craft with a small C, not a large C. Um, it's not as important. Ceramic artists aren't as important as painters or printmakers or photographers um, because the assumption is, is that the work itself, is, if it's functional, is not really um, conceptual, I guess. And um, in this particular piece, this is a, um, a place um, of, it was actually sort of set up as a shrine. This is Kawai Kanjiro Studio and um, Kyoto. And what struck me when I went in here was uh, the sense of space and how important it was to create an installation. It's almost like an art installation, which was just his place of working. Now, I know that he's gone now, and this is set up as a kind of a, a shrine to his work. But uh, Kawai Kanjiro, along with Soji Amada and um, Yanagi were really um, important um, intellectuals in Japan in the early 30s. And uh, they kind of codified what was considered the menge or the folk art mu movement in Japan itself. So um, these three men were um, involved with an English potter named Barnard Leach. And um, they also came to the United States and brought their sense of Japanese aesthetics to the US. And, ceramic production was completely changed because prior to that, it was influenced by Northern European um, kind of approach to pottery making. But look at these hand tools. I mean, just the idea of this sense of beauty in all of the utilitarian objects. This is a shot inside of his kiln. And um, in Japan, all of the kilns were treated as shrines, um, even for living potters. Uh, these are all saggers, so uh, saggers are pots that uh, pots are fired into um, because the wood firing process actually deposits so much ash on the pieces that it will obscure the glaze. And so they protected them in these kind of controlled forms. And the fact that these saggers are still in the kiln and no one's even opened them, it's actually kind of amazing. There's one of my students, um, Justine in the um, background. This is at Shigaraki. Um, I took the students here for two weeks and we uh, studied at a, um, a studio and made pots. This is a Nabora Gama kiln, which is a hill climbing kiln, obviously not used anymore, but in the front, you can see all the saggers. Um, and, and this idea of wood firing, which is a, an extremely analog process, <laughs> it's the oldest fuel that's used and um, and why would you use it in the 21st century when we can have electricity and computer, computer controlled temperatures? But there's something about this process um, which contributes not only a change in the surface, but it's a, a kind of a, a commitment to a, a kind of a performance, I guess, in terms of making. This is just a, another example of these beautiful, like, patterns, organic patterns, the imposition of order on chaos or nature, which, and um, this, while this looks like the typical tourist shot outside, uh, this artist is Hosan Tani, and um, he invited myself and my students um, to his house a number of times, and we engaged in these sort of deep um, conversations, philosophical conversation, artist conversations, and um, he, and, and there was an event that was actually like sort of life-changing to me. He invited me into the special part of his work uh, that was sort of a, a set apart from everywhere else and put a bamboo stick on the ground. And he invited me to step over the stick and he was explaining um, the 
importance of the tea ceremony and um, inside this sort of controlled space, every aspect, every detail, every motion and movement through the space was considered and understood and um, studied and every bit of conversation was incredibly important. And I thought about the connection to pottery and functional form as, uh, as a way to elevate ritual and sort of mundane ritual, like even eating meals. And uh, in the 21st century, we don't think about those things anymore. We're divorced from the ritual of eating or the importance of eating and maybe a little bit less now because we're all sort of confined in our own homes. But I think most people are just, they just don't think about slowing down and sort of understanding the importance of those small acts. So I also had a chance to go to Korea uh, with Mindy Solomon and a number of her collectors. And we had, you know, once again, another huge aesthetic experience that um, had an influence on my work. These are kimchi jars. Kimchi is, these are jars that are made out of clay. They're huge. Um, they were in every area that I saw in, in Korea. They were on um, high rise balconies. Everybody uses these um, clay handmade forms to as an important part of food production, but also uh, more importantly as a sort of an identity marker for what it is to be Korean. And so once again, this idea of the humble pot um, becomes a mark of cultural identity. And I was also like totally taken by all these walls, um, you know, patterns, once again, the imposition of order on chaos or this organic patterning. And the elevation of simple forms, uh, simple, formal, um, very organic, um, softly undulating forms. I mean, these are not um, deep in terms of a content. Um, there's no real narrative in terms of a story, um, you know, but it is about breath and it's about um, breathing and life and all, all of these other kinds of considerations. And then I had to throw this in. This is a, just a common pot. This probably is a, about 500 years old, a Korean, um, just a market pot. I mean, this is just a, a peasant's pot, essentially. It wasn't really for anything special, but the sense of importance tied to these simple objects is just kind of amazing to me. Which brings me to, um, you know, people living now. And so probably one of the biggest influences on me and my life and my work is my husband, Mark Felt. Um, he's a, I think a great potter. I mean, he's of course my husband and I'm completely not totally objective about that, but um, he works on the kick wheel. And I think the way that he approached his work um, in terms of his um, technique and approach like his a way into the work. He's very quiet and sort of subtle, but he makes these kind of incredible forms. This is a just a flask of his. And when I was getting my MFA, my um, lead instructor was Richard Beckman. And uh, Richard Beckman happened to be um, not only my teacher, but was also my friend and a studio mate, um, Mark and I. We're at Rat Soap Studios with him. I watched him make most of these pieces. Um, I remember his um, concern with, um, because these were very emotional pieces for him, but they were so tight and sort of controlled, um, but he made vessels and it was something that we actually had a lot in common. We spent hours talking about this. It's too bad he's not around. He was really a, a great artist in this area. Um, and he also used um, this idea of grids and patterning and, and um, sort of space organization that's really interesting. Um, so it's one of his metal pieces and you can see one of his wooden pieces in the background. I got to watch him make all of these. Um, so once again, that kind of community of artists where you have um, an intimate space and you have this sort of intense um, personal relationship around work is, um, and then other artists too. I mean, I don't think there's anybody uh, that's made work in the late 20th century or early 21st century that's not 
influenced by someone like Ava Hess. And while she's known mostly for her sculpture, uh, her drawings to me are the things that resonate almost the most. This is just a simple, another organic sort of gridded pattern. Um, and then one of her um, gouache drawings. She was an incredible colorist. I mean, people don't really think of her that way, but. And oddly enough, she was also a student of Joseph Albers. And this semester I have been teaching my students color theory via Joseph Albers exercises. So I always feel like these connections always sort of roll back over on themselves. And then this artist, Robert Kushner, pattern and decoration artist. And um, I love the way uh, he, he went to the Middle East and studied Middle Eastern pottery and uh, mosaic tiles, um, and which has influenced his work with these botanical drawings that are layered and kind of overlapping each other. And while the organic forms then are um, sort of controlled by this grid pattern, I think his work is incredible. And once again, that sort of loose, open line, um, having your art, your hand really open when you're drawing. Uh, these are not tight in any sense, um, but the sort of reliance on pattern. And then um, while he looked at Middle Eastern work, he was also looking at work from Asia. And which leads me back to my backyard again. So every morning I wake up and this is outside my bedroom window. We live in a swamp. Um, which I think is probably one of the most beautiful places in Florida, um, any swamp actually. Uh, they're so full of life, you know, people zoom by them, I guess developers try to mow them down, but um, these cypress trees are just so amazing. And, um, and so is my garden. So I grow a lot of flowers, which find their way into my pot. So these are some of my oak leaf hydrangeas. And of course, azaleas, which rings, brings us back to the kiln again. So this is the kiln in the firing state. Um, this is another liminal space. When we get into the space, um, oft, oftentimes, actually mostly, Mackenzie Smith and Jonathan Barnes always help us fire because this takes a community of people to pull this off. I, we couldn't do it without them. Um, we are we move through this sort of dangerous area without speaking sometimes. Sometimes we talk a lot and laugh and joke, but mostly it's just a kind of knowing how to understand the firing and understand the problems. Um, when we load the kilns, it, um, we have a number of shelves and we have to, it takes about a day to stack all these pots. This is only half stacked. And it takes us several days to actually cut the wood and stack it to get ready for the firings. And then they happen. And um, inside the firebox itself, it's about 2400 degrees Fahrenheit. When we throw the wood in, it literally explodes into flame. Um, what people don't really um, realize is that the fire is so hot that the ash from the wood actually turns into glass. It's belching. I see all these flames coming out. And then after we do all of this and this sort of incredible process, we actually have to wait a week before we can open up the door to even see what happens inside. Oops. So what happens is you end up with this work that comes out and um, sometimes it's a fail, which is depressing and sometimes it's not, um, but So here's the process itself. I'm um, just doing a, a slip uh, transfer. It's just a, basically a monoprint on clay. Um, and then here's some of the work. So these are some of my coffee mugs. Um, the colors stay really bright. And in wood firing, that's actually kind of unusual. Uh, normally you see really brown work. Um, I like the fact that I've been able to figure out how to get color out of it. Um, this cl The clay body is not glaze, that's just what the wood does to the surface. And I think about the formal elements all the time, and I think uh, we might be talking a little bit about this later, but um, how the classes I teach um, actually find themselves uh, weaving into the work. 
It's another piece in progress, just in, built in greenware and then out of the kiln. And this is a plate sort of similar to one of the azalea plates that's in the uh, gallery right now. And then it's fired. And uh, you can always, if you're looking at the pots themselves, you can find out certain, it gives you clues about how they're fired. So if you look on the upper right hand side, you can see where it's really the, the image is softened. That's where the flame actually hit the pot and went across the surface. These are some tiles and I'm interested in doing tiles. This might be going back to my sort of painterly roots a little bit, but just this idea of um, how the firing softens the line and um, bleeds it out um, and, and how these images overlap and there's layers of information behind them. And with all of these tiles, you know, just in terms of the variety inside the kiln itself, I mean, I feel like I have, I'm so tight in terms of my working process that the kiln itself actually allows me a place to let it go and give up control, which I think is kind of an interesting problem. So the variation in all these tiles are, are a result of where they were placed in the kiln itself, um, and which is something that's not and I think that's actually the beauty in it, really. So you can see how the flame hit on the bottom and sort of bled this all out. It literally eats into the surface of the clay. The firing process is intense. I mean, anything that goes to 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit, it's, that's hot. So I play between sort of stylized floral arrangements or forms and then these sort of more uh, it's still fairly stylized, not so. Um, these are flowers that actually grow in front of my studio. And you can kind of see the, the imagery or sort of the hand. Um, the way I draw, the, I start with the black line. The way I draw these is I've actually got these little bottles um, filled with underglaze. They have really fine tips. And so I actually just draw with a bottle um, directly on the newsprint. Just another one, another azalea platter and um, some stylized. And this is similar to what's on the gallery right now. So I just um, love making these little sculptural functional forms. So this is a little jar. It's kind of got a gestural quality to it, which I feel that harkens back to some of my previous work from my past. Um, and I'm interested always in the gestural quality of the clay when it's wet and pushing around and um, trying to create that sense of space in the interior where it expands out against the skin of the surface. And I've also made a ton of baskets. I think the basket forms um, to me are intriguing because of the negative space between the handle and the body. Um, they're not functional in the sense of um, like a basket you would use, but they are great. They make great flower vases. Here's another little one. You can kind of see with a floral arrangement in one, which is a stylized sort of oak leaf hydrangea flower. And then finally this, and it kind of gives you a close up on the surface itself. So, um, these uh, works that I'm doing now, I'm actually drawing on top of drawings on top of drawings and sort of creating um, the sense of um, layers. Um, because I thought about um, the way fabric sometimes is printed and if it gets off register, I sort of love that kind of um, inconsistency to the form and the surface. So hopefully um, this explained a little bit about my work and I, I hope some of you guys have some questions. So. Kim, thank you. This is a uh, really amazing. Um, we do have some questions in the chat, um, quite quite a few. Um, first off is, um, of course, everyone loved your time lapse video. Um, 
<laughs> Can you give us an idea of how long it takes to actually construct a piece like the one you made in the time lapse? That was about three hours, two and a half or three hours. Great. So not too long, but not too short either. <laughs> um, we have another question. Um, uh, you, you mentioned sort of seeing as um, the making of these pieces as a performance. Um, is this something that you think of as you're, um, when you're making it yourself? Or um, is this something that you sort of think of more when you're looking at other artists' work? So uh, one of the interesting thing about uh, ceramicists in general is they uh, work in groups a lot of times. So you're working in either a studio, a cooperative studio, because you have to because of the kiln, but also as a teacher, I'm a performer. And so when I make the work, I do feel like there's a sort of performance aspect to um, the making. Now, maybe the I'm performing for the audience of one, I don't know, or, um, you know, but there, I do a lot of demonstrations. Like I go to groups of people and I make work for, um, you know, people pay money to watch me work. So there is that part of it as well. So um, yeah, I, I, I just think that's something that's usually not talked about, but I think it's a big part of a lot of uh, ceramicist um, sort of repertoire, I guess. Very cool. Um, do you have a website for your work where people can sort of see what you're doing? I've got um, my Instagram account. I should have a website, um, <laughs> God. but you can find me at, at Kim Kirchman on Instagram, um, which is a lot of images on my pieces there. Uh, we're hoping to have the Tampa Tour de Clay uh, come back. It's sort of in this abbreviated form this year. Um, Mark and I decided to pull out. I didn't want a bunch of people coming through our studio for obvious reasons. Um, you know, I mean, this is, you know, weird times, I guess, this year. I don't think anybody here would disagree with that. <laughs> well, this is sort of the understatement. <laughs> weird times. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, uh, so Emily had a question in the chat that she put in. Um, she says, first off, she never realized that many of your forms are not thrown, but constructed in slabs. Are your large platters thrown and cut, or are they all hand-built? They're all hand-built. And um, so there was a reason for that as well. I mean, I think the slowness of hand building is really kind of interesting. And even though I work in series and you noticed when I did the time-lapse photography or speed up of the, I did have some templates, but because every one of these pieces is considered a one-off, it's not, I'm not, a, um, I'm not a production potter, I'm a studio potter. I think of each one as an individual piece. So hand building actually uh, facilitates that. Very cool. Um, so you spoke briefly about the, um, the tour that has been sort of truncated this year. Um, is there anywhere where folks can purchase your works? Um, so, so far, no. I mean, you could purchase them here. Um, I'm not in any local galleries. Um, I make work. So my working uh, process is I work full time at school teaching. Um, I have two kids that maybe one day they'll move out of the house. <laughs> there are older adults. One is trying to go to college. I don't know what's happening there because she's well. And the other one, God only knows when that kid will move out. Um, so I have my family life. And um, this year I've uh, turn my studio into a uh, production studio space for uh, 2D design projects. And there's a couple of teachers I know in the group that completely can understand this. Um, so it, this has been a hard year. I think this year has been a year to sort of pull back a little bit. Um, I'm making work still, but mo more slowly. Um, but that being said, I've always told my students, um, I'm an artist that teaches. I mean, I think that being a working artist is actually one of the most important aspects of becoming uh, an art professor. I don't think you can actually impart um, real knowledge to your kids unless you're actually working yourself or committed to the process of working. Um, so 
yeah, I, I should be more organized. I'm just not that organized. <laughs> That's just terrible. <laughs> we kind of get it this year. Um, and also your children will never move out when you live in such a beautiful place. You should, you should. Oh my God. I mean, sometimes we come up with these strategies, like Mark and I just go, we could just leave. <laughs> but we don't want to leave. So I don't know what'll happen. They're, they're great kids. They're really, actually really great kids. They're both super creative people. You know, I have, um, one's a writer and one's an artist and they're just incredible kids. They're Maybe they just like us or maybe they don't. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure they love you guys. They put up with us, I guess. Um, you brought up a really interesting point um, and you mentioned that you um, sort of differentiated craft with a capital C with, from craft with a small C. Do you have a um, sort of feeling or a viewpoint on the term craft in general versus the term art being used to describe what you do? Well, I, so this is a weird kind of um, conflict, I guess, or tension within um, people that pursue the fine crafts, I guess, in terms of how they're perceived in more of the fine arts world. So um, I, I think it's, it's not quite as bad as it used to be, but in a certain way, maybe people that um, work in fine crafts always feel kind of a chip on their shoulder about it. Um, mostly because I, I think a lot of craft artists, because they're so materially oriented, they talk a lot about material use and um, um, their engagement with the material itself and all the process that goes with it. Because to be a craft artist, you actually have to be super skilled you're showing a certain like high degree of skill with a material. And that is not an intellectual approach. That's, that's an approach that talks more about time and um, experience. Uh, that said, um, there's something about um, a pursuit of that kind of expertise that um, sort of elevates it into something else. Um, because, uh, you know, what is that, right? I mean, we're I think all artists, they ask themselves these questions in their work and um, they spend their life trying to figure out what the answers are. And if they ever came close to an answer, they would just pursue another question because then what would be the point? I mean, um, you know, but you're constantly having to challenge yourself in all these ways. And um, so my feeling about this is, uh, I. I feel like I came from a fairly conceptual background initially when I came into work. Um, I'm a nerd. I love reading critical theory and art. I, uh, I use a lot of uh, critical theory in my classes. I expect my students to actually have a vocabulary and, and think about things that way. Um, and, and I make functional pots. So like those two things seem sort of far off, but they're actually not. And, uh, you know, for instance, uh, you know, if you look at this uh, basket that's up right now, um, not only is it a basket and it's a pretty formal sort of arrangement of um, shape and form and surface, uh, but I'm really um, sort of intrigued by all of the areas where it's becoming something or it's not, it's, it's something else. So I, Look at the lip, for instance. The lip of a pot is where the exterior and the interior meet. And um, there always needs to be some kind of a transition there. And so what happens at that particular point actually can have a huge effect, not on the aesthetics of a, a vessel, but the way you read the vessel itself or sort of like visually consume it. So I always think of these areas in the form that are sort of the liminal points. And those are the points that become the most important um, and more intriguing, I guess, for myself. And, um, you know, and you can even look at the pot. So like every time there is a border, there's actually visual emphasis there, right? Because the, that liminality point is, is super important. So I don't know if that, maybe I went on a tangent a bit. I don't know. <laughs> no, it was good. Um, we have a good question. Um, uh, how much wood on average does it take to fire off the kiln? It takes about two and a half cords of wood. Now the wood itself, um, we get from um, Weiss hardwoods. They make um, stairwells and cabinets in Pinellas County. And so we have them 
bring over all their cast offs, all their cutoffs, the stuff that would end up going into the, um, you know, landfill essentially. So it's all wasted wood. It's all hardwood. It's fine, perfectly fine. So in some ways I feel pretty good about that, you know, because we're using a, a fuel source that would just be thrown out anyway. Um, it's not carbon neutral, but it's not, it's also not gas or, you know, natural gas or propane. So yeah, it takes a lot of wood. It's a lot actually. <laughs> It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty staggering to, to see how much it takes to make these pieces, um, both in the sort of communal effort between all of you, um, the wood, the heat, um, the fact that you have to wait a week before you can open the door again. Um, it's quite impactful, I think, to a lot of us. There's a lot of comments and I'm gonna make sure to send you um, a copy of the chat. Um, and of course, this will be posted in the next few days, um, but, uh, there's a lot of comments in the chat here that um, people are just, they love your work. Um, Joan mentioned that she feels like a lot of your work evokes a welcoming earth goddess. So um, again, sort of utilizing the, the nature that surrounds you to inspire you. Thanks. Well, thanks everybody for showing up. I mean, I really appreciate it. It was fun to do this and, um, you know, stay healthy, stay safe out there. <laughs> Yeah, um, thank you so much, uh, Kim. We are um, honored to have you with us and to take part in this program with us. Um, remember to come and stop by the museum if you have not seen Kim's work and the other work by the incredibly talented faculty um, at St. Petersburg College. Make sure you come by the Lipa Ratner and check out their exhibition. It is on view in our changing galleries um, through February 7th of the coming year. So there's lots of time for you to come in and visit. Uh, our front desk staff is friendly and always willing to answer questions. And you can see Kim's work, as I said, um, as well as many other talented, amazing artists through the college. Um, so Kim, thank you so much for taking the time, putting together that incredible video. I think everyone really loved getting a sneak peek into the process of making these pieces. Um, we really appreciate it and we appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks, Kim. That was awesome. Oh, thanks, guys. Yeah, wow, fabulous I program. See a few of you out there. It's, it's nice seeing you, Joan. And <laughs> <Emily>. <laughs> Beautiful work. Beautiful. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. As Kim said, stay healthy. Um, have a happy Thanksgiving. Um, we're thankful for all of you tuning in. Um, we're thankful for our incredibly talented faculty at the college. Um, and um, I hope all of you have a fabulous um, Thanksgiving holiday. Bye. Thank you. you as well. Be safe. Be safe, everyone. Be healthy.